Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fredrik Ivarsson, covering the uh, consumer goods sector at ABG. I'm happy to introduce Emil Salles from Viva One Group, who will uh, present for approximately 20 minutes, and, and then we will follow up with a few questions afterwards. So uh, with that, I leave the word to Emil. Thank you, Fredrik. Happy to be here. As mentioned, I'm Emil Salnes, the CEO and one of the founders of Viva Wine Group, also one of the main owners. And as of uh, December 14th, we are listed on the First North Premier Growth Market here in Stockholm, which was, uh, of course, a big step for the company forward, but uh, not even a new chapter in my view. It's really a new step into a new era where we, we are going into the e-com market to grow even more in the future. So where we are right now is that we are, we are active in eight different countries. We are, and this is really the heart of the business, we are 25 entrepreneurs. So our model is really that we have one holding company, Viva Wine Group, and in each of the daughter companies, the MD and one or several key employees are also share shareholders of the specific daughter company. And this is a model which has been very, very important for us in order to keep growing and keep challenging ourselves and also in order to keep people. So it's really at the heart of our business and very important and something we will keep in the future. And at the IPO, everyone uh, invested also on the Viva Wine Group level. So all the 25 entrepreneurs are involved in the business for the future as well. In total, we have 10 op op operating companies uh, and our business consists really of two different parts. One very stable e-com, sorry, very stable business in the Nordics where we sell to the monopolies. And uh, as mentioned in the name, Viva Wine Group, we sell wine, and wine is 99% of our total business. Then the other 25% is in, in the e-com business based in Germany, which I, will, I come, which I will come into later. In the Nordics, we are the clear market leader with around 18% of the, of the total market in, in the, to the combined monopoly countries, Sweden, Finland, and Norway. Uh, in terms of reporting, we separate Sweden and the Nordics uh, because Sweden is a very important part of the total business still, 58%, 17% is the Nordics, and then 23% and e in, in the coming years even more is the e-com part. Very important part of our business is the uh, uh, blend of own brands and partner brands. Own brands give you the advantage of higher margins and better control, while partner brands, of course, give you the everything all the investment, shared investments, and also the, the renome of, of these partner brands. So we have a good, very good balance, around 50-50 would be the goal over time. Final important part of our business is the sustainability part, where we are pioneer leader, pioneers and leaders in, in our business. And everything is summarized in an uh, assured GRI report, so assured by our auditors, which is unique for our business and even quite unique for, for the Nordics to have a GRI assured uh, sustainability report. So the operating companies are uh, for the Nordics, six companies in Sweden. So here, this is where the model has been uh, used for the longest time. So that's why we have uh, the, the most companies. That's, this is where we started. Some of the companies have been started organically. Some of the companies have been acquired. The Nordic companies, CISA in Finland and Norway, Norwegian Beverage Group in Norway, were acquired companies in 2015, but has since tripled in size. So we are very good at buying companies and also making them grow. Also, the German business has been acquired, starting with Wine in Black in 2019 and uh, finishing now in 21 with Vicampo and Weinfürst, which was acquired uh, August last year. And with these businesses, we, we have now a very strong position in the German e-com market and also a very good uh, platform to grow further in, into the e-com of the Europe. Historically, we have had very strong growth, as indicated on the left-hand side. We are also increasing our market share in all segments. And, the, and the, going forward, we are focusing on realizing synergies in the e-com, uh, in the Nordics. We will expand the e-com business into new markets, especially the Weinfuss concept, which I'll come back to. And we will also have a quite ambitious M&A agenda, which uh, our history, I think historically we've done 13 uh, or 14 uh, acquisitions and that's something that we'll continue to do. Going back to Nordics, this is a very stable business, which especially in times like this uh, uh, shows very well. Uh, in general, the business uh, grows around 2 to 3% by value, three, around 3% by value. 
every year. Of course, during the COVID, as many people might have noticed, the sales of the Nordic monopolies were very, very high, but they are now being normalized. And what we have seen historically and what we expect to see in the future is a very stable business that grows uh, over time. It, put it a little bit differently, people will drink wine in the Nordics regardless of how the total economy is going or not. They might change a little bit in prices, but we are present in all price levels, so for us it's, it's not, not, not such a big problem as such. Uh, in Sweden, uh, we have a market share of... Uh, sorry, uh, we can just skip forward and rather to the e-com, which is the interesting part here, where we have three different brands. We have Wine & Black, the one that we acquired the first, which is catering to the premium segment, V Campo to the mid-price segment, and Wine First to the entry-level segment. And this is segmentation in terms of wine in e-com. Of course, if you are in a supermarket, you will always find an even lower price segment. But these are the three segments that can be uh, that we can market ourselves to in the e-com and make it profitable. And we are profitable, and this is a very important part of, of our business. So the wine first co concept, for example, is profitable already from the first order, meaning that our, the acquisition cost of the customer uh, is actually covered by the margin on the first order. And if we can, and which we are doing, can expand this business further, this is, of course, a very good business to grow in the, f in the future. We have had a very strong growth in customers, 147% plus between 19 and 21. Of course, obviously driven a little bit by, by the COVID and the pandemics and the lockdowns. But now that we are in the uh, in sort of a more, more normalized uh, world, we, we do see that 77% uh, of our sales are coming from repeat customers. And of course, for any e-com company, that is the most important part to keep customers buying from, from your sites. So in, in the mid part of the picture, you see where we are established, the dark, dark purple is Germany. And then you see the other markets that we have started up in around Germany. And all these can be serviced from, from the same warehouse. Uh, right now we have two warehouses. Remember one of the acquisitions were done in 21, so we haven't had time to put everything into the same warehouse. But from 23, we expect to have everything in the same warehouse and we will be able to serve all these countries and actually a little bit further on from that and deliver within 48 hours from one warehouse. Obviously a very strong point in terms of synergies. The e-com market uh, is uh, a growing market and when we entered the market we saw that it had a very low online penetration uh, of around 5-6% in 2020 and if we expect that just to grow to 8% in 2025, already there you have a uh, around 10% of an annual growth in the future. Again, uh, industry pioneer within sustainability, and this is an important part of our business. And we take care of the sustainability on all different levels of the uh, value chain. We work with organic wines and uh, encourage, encu uh, uh, encourage organic production on the uh, farming side. We also make sure that the workers have good con working conditions by being part of Amfuri and Fair for Life, for example, and Fair Trade. And then once we, the, the wine is put in bottle, we choose uh, climate smart bottling. That could be a PET bottle, lightweight glass bottle, bag and box, tetra. There are even cans nowadays. There are plenty of alternatives for climate smart packaging. Then we transport it as well as possible for, for the climate as well, using trains and boats. And then once we are in the market, we are also very active in our trade organization to, tip, to make sure that our, our products are consumed in a responsible way. And in order to show that this is not just uh, something we do for, because we should, it is really something that has driven our business uh, very well in the future. You can look on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you see that our share of organic wines in Sweden is around 40%. And organic wines is a segment that has been growing twice as fast than all other segments. So going organic, going sustainable is a very important part of our business and drives our sales. Just a quick update on the first quarter now after having been listed. It has been a quite strong start, despite the world being very turbulent. Obviously, COVID, wars, you know the story. Uh, our logistics and product teams have been securing goods in an unpre un under unprecedented circumstances. So it's a very important part of our business is that we have a very strong logistics and product setup. 
So we have been able to mitigate the out-of-stock situation to a very large degree. Our net sales increased by 27% in Q1. This is very much boosted by the, the acquisition of Vcampo and Norwegian Beverage Group that were not part of the numbers last year. Because the overall market slowed down uh, compared to Q1 2021, again, COVID, war, inflation fears, also to some degree the seasonality has affected the organic growth in all markets. But in the monopoly markets where we have solid numbers, we see that our market shares are growing. So we are now just waiting for things to normalize a little bit and we expect to grow further in the next quarters. Uh, or at least in the next 12 months. When it comes to acquisitions, we actually did an acquisition, a smaller one in Sweden in uh, Q1 of Wien Klubben. This is Sweden's uh, largest online community, and this is a very important part of our communication and how we launch products in Sweden. We'll not go into that uh, in detail in this presentation, but marketing is a very important part of this, and this means that we have, a very, we have over a million uh, consumers that we have the possibility to be in direct contact with. Again, net sales grew by 27%. Our gross margin also grew from 21.5 to 25%. And our EBITDA from uh, 78 to 95 million, it dropped a little bit in terms of percentages. And here it's important to reiterate, and I mentioned at the beginning that our e-com business is profitable. And actually, our e-com business drives profitability on the total, over, total level. So we have a financial target of 10 to 12% over time. And here we expect the Nordic business to be within the 10 to 12%, while the e-com over time always will be driving the EBIT percentages upwards somewhat. And this is, again, very important, profitable e-com. Well, again, I, I went into the financial targets before even clicking them forward. You see that we expect at least 4% growth in the medium term, 10 to 15% for the e-commerce in the medium term. And considering the circumstances, medium term has really to be seen as 6 to 12 months into the future. Uh, right now, all the markets are contracting after the, after the COVID pandemic. And, and of course, on top of that, we have the war situation. I mentioned that we will grow through acquisitions. We have also a profitability target that I mentioned. Net debt target, quite normal, two and a half times EBDA. At this time, we are at 0 0.8, I believe, so we are very well placed for future acquisitions. And final slide, uh, on the agenda for the future and uh, for the coming years, it's really about keeping that entrepreneurial spirit that I mentioned in the beginning. Super important for our business to, to always keep the drive in all the entrepreneurs and all the staff in the team. And I believe that we are there, but it will always be on the top of the agenda. Then we're working a lot on synergies across the business segments. We have a little bit of work to do in the Nordics to, to work closer together in the Nordics. And as mentioned before, we are putting all the e-com businesses into one organization in Germany. M&A, we are medium active for the moment. It's not the best time to make acquisitions in general, but we will always make acquisitions and we are actively looking at a lot of cases right now. Product innovation, again, very important part of especially the Nordic business. We are launching 30, 40 products each quarter in the Nordics, which is a very, very high pace of launching products. But then remember, we have six companies in Sweden, one in Norway, one in Finland. We have eight companies, while some of our peers might only have one organization for launching products. So this is, again, one of the keys of being many companies is that we can also launch more products. And as we have done that very successfully, we have a higher growth than most of our peers. And final point, and right now, it's a lot about keeping the margins and focusing on, on pricing. Important to know about the Nordic business is that we can change the prices two to three times per year, which means that we, we basically over time control our margins. Uh, the um, retailer, the monopolies are not negotiating these prices. Obviously, the customer might say no if they don't like the price, they will not buy the product again. But in terms of, of the retailer, we don't have that discussion. So that means that we will be able to keep our margins. And this is something we put a lot of focus on in these times. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Frederick, any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Emil. Great presentation. Um, and um, uh, starting with Sweden, maybe, um, you've been gaining market shares for many, many years. 
Uh, and I think you touched upon it a little bit, but would you care to, to elaborate on the key success factors in Sweden? Why, why do you outpace the market at this pace? The way we work with six different companies, the way we work with having at least around 50% of, of the brands that we sell are our own brands, which means that we can control them and tailor make them for the market. But also the way we launch products in the market, which means that we are one of the best of launching products in the market. Uh, these are not launches that go through a gatekeeper at the monopoly. In the three Nordic monopolies, we are allowed to change. Uh, we are allowed to change, uh, introduce products uh, anyway, any any time we want. And if we can, uh, by marketing, create a demand, these products can then be listed locally and eventually get into wider distribution. And this is the model that we really use and which we are have a much higher pace on and in the Swedish context also have a quite big advantage of size because we, our marketing costs are more efficient than most of our peers. Right. Uh, and now you're trying to make the same journey in the other Nordic countries. So uh, are there any reasons not to make that journey? Any structural uh, challenges, so to speak, in, in uh, Norway or Finland make it more it's a, little, it's a little bit different. F Finland is, is the key. Finland works very similar the, to Sweden. So in, in Finland, uh, they, they have the advantage of also always being able to take part of a pipeline of product launches from Sweden. And since Sweden is a little bit of the trendsetter in the Nordics, it means that when these products are ready in Sweden, they will be the next thing in Finland. So there we have a big advantage. And this is why we have tripled in size in Finland over the last uh, seven years. Uh, in Norway, it's a little bit different. In Norway, marketing is not allowed, so our basic model does not apply there. So in Norway, acquisitions might be more, more interesting, but we have also been able to grow very steadily by acquiring, for example, other brands in, in, the, Nordic, in the Norwegian market. Gotcha. And, and then uh, if we move on to e-commerce, um, obviously on a, on a performa basis, very strong margins, 14% almost last year. Uh, and, and maybe that was a little bit boosted by the, by the pandemic. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and your group target, again, between 10 and 12%. Do, do you expect the e-commerce channel to be slightly above the group uh, average going forward? Or, or how do you view uh, the margin profile in that segment? No, but that, that's exactly how we see it. I think uh, at, the, uh, at this time, we, we expect the, uh, the e-com to be around the 12%, slightly above, slightly below, uh, depending a little bit on how we look on the customer acquisition, while the, uh, the Nordic business will always be sort of over time in the mid, mid part of that uh, 10 to 12%. Understood. Um, and then uh, you mentioned uh, M&A as well. You have a very active M&A agenda for sure. Um, and then presumably multiples have come down a little bit uh, overall in this uh, sort of market landscape that we're in. Um, so can you, can you um, say anything about the current market uh, environment in terms of M&A? Yes, uh, I, th I think one of the things that in, depending on whether it's the Nordic or, or, or the e-com business, uh, one of the key aspects is really that we have to... Uh, to focus on getting what are the real numbers after COVID, because there, there is a co correction and in, in, many, in some companies a quite big correction to be made. So I think buyer and seller has to meet each other in, in terms of expectations. And then of course, with interest rates going up, we should see multiples going down. So on our part, we have to be a little bit, uh, let's say, we have to play it a little bit cool as well in order to not push margins, sorry, push multiples too high. Mm. Yeah, of course. And, and then in terms of, of potential targets, what are you uh, looking for? Are you looking for big platform acquisitions or more smaller bolt-on acquisitions to the... It, it depends on the market uh, really, but market leading positions is, is really important for us. Uh, that then depending on, on the country that there might be uh, add-ons that can be made to the existing platforms as well. But uh, for the e-com, it's really about opening up totally new markets or almost new markets for us. Okay, okay. Um, and then maybe looking a bit more short term, we saw the market obviously on the back of very tough comps uh, uh, contracting a little bit in Q1. Uh, can you say anything on what you've seen in the overall uh, Nordic market landscape in, in uh, April and May? Well, the, the Nordic continues to be, be fairly s slow in April and May. Uh, so the, the correction will probably continue until 
the end of Q2, that's for sure. So, so you can expect something that looks quite similar to, to January to March. Uh, for the economy, it, it's quite similar or even slightly worse. Uh, so so a, a little bit less than, than, than last year in terms of, of everything. Then, of course, for the e-com, and especially in Germany being our biggest market, in June, the lockdowns were eased last year. So then the comps should be more comparable in the, in the months from June and onwards. Okay, okay, understood. Um, and then, uh, as seen in, in many other uh, consumer companies or in any other company uh, for that matter, uh, we've seen uh, raw material prices uh, skyrocketing and, and uh, I, I suspect that that's the case in your business as well. So h how well can you, uh, can you uh, meet these uh, price uh, increases or, or cost inflation in terms of raising prices yourself? Yeah, uh, you're totally right. We, we, we do have a lot of uh, inflationary pressures and then in, on, on top of everything there are uh, glass bottle uh, uh, facilities in the Ukraine as well, which makes it even more difficult for, for, for sourcing glass bottles. But uh, over time we are very confident that we will be able to, to keep our uh, or even strengthen our margins, uh, considering the fact that we are allowed to change prices in Finland already now in July, uh, in Sweden it will be in September, Finland again in October, also in September, October in Norway. So in these markets uh, we are able to, to look at the margins already in, in a quite short short time, while in the e-com of course we, are, we can and we are allowed to change prices quite immediate, immediately. Okay, so in a sort of medium term, you expect to, to uh, increase margins in the Nordics? Absolutely. Give us some time, six to 12 months, we, we, we expect to, to be back on slightly increasing margins, the, the ones that we had also, if you look at 18, 19, 20, if you look at the development a little bit more historically. Mm. And, and the key drivers for that is, is it product mix and, and premiumization? As it's been premiumization before. together with, uh, with, of course, better use of, of, of the staff. So we, for, for launching more products, we don't need more, more people in the companies. And, and especially that's been the case in, in Finland and Norway, where we grow quite steadily now with, while keeping the same amount of staff. So. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And and in terms of uh, consumer preferences uh, during these uh, uh, times of high inflation, uh, have you say, seen any specific uh, uh, movements uh, within the within the um, uh, consumer uh, preferences? It's a little bit early to say because we do have the, the sort of return from COVID. The strong trend we saw before was the premiumization. We saw it already 18, 19 and in 20 as well. And, continuing and of course that meant that people were buying a little bit more expensive wines instead of going out to restaurants. Then whether this sort of uh, uh, re resetting of the market means that people are going back to buying cheaper wines or if they just right now are spending a little bit more money on restaurants, I believe in the later. So it is very difficult to go, go back once you've increased your, your sort of average price point for wine. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to follow for sure. Um, maybe uh, a last question on the competitive landscape, because we've seen quite some consolidation, I think, between big players, uh, uh, both uh, uh, in, in Finland and, uh, and in Norway as well, with the Royal Unibrew uh, buying a couple of companies there. Uh, have you seen any effect of those uh, uh, consolidations yet? or Not really. I would say that our dear uh, competitors are uh, spending a lot of time in organi organizing themselves internally. And, uh, and so, so externally, we haven't seen that much yet. But we, we do expect this to, to continue. And as mentioned, we have an active M&A agenda as well. And if we acquire companies, that will, by definition, be further consolidation. So mm. we expect that, yes. Yeah. Yeah, interesting times indeed, and uh, we're looking forward to, to follow your journey, Emil. Uh, thank you. And uh, by that, I thank you all for, uh, for listening, um, and have a good one.